they call me Al Fadi. I, it's Abdul Fadi, but it's kind of short um, for Abdul Fadi. Uh, those of you who speak Arabic, uh, you know what it means. It's servant of the Savior, basically. And um, I am originally from a Muslim background. I come from Saudi Arabia, and uh, I came here about 23 years ago. And uh, I was searching for the truth uh, at that time, but it took me almost 12 years since I arrived back then to be able to find the truth. But one of those obstacles that I was faced with is how can I know for sure that the source of truth that I am going to basically base my faith decision on that tells me that Jesus is my savior, that tells me that without Christ I am without hope of eternal life and so on and so forth. How can I know that this source is a source that worth trusting? Now, I want to start by this disclaimer. All of you, I'm assuming, are college students or at least been through college one way or another. And you know that research is important. And you know that getting the sources accurately and quoting the sources accurately and relying on the solid foundation is important. And also, sometimes technically speaking, we may try to get really technical in our search for the truth, but let me assure you of this. When it comes to faith and when it comes to the Bible, at the end of the day, it's a personal decision, has nothing whatsoever to do with intellectual abilities or with convictions based on those things. The Bible teaches that the spiritual man will discern the things of the spirit, and the natural man will not understand the things of the spirit. In other words, at the end of the day, it is between you and God that will make that final decision. My job is to share with you some of the things that I am able to share in the next hour. And trust me, I spent an entire semester teaching on is the Bible worthy of being trusted. I'm condensing a whole semester for you in an hour. You get the idea. So do not assume that all of your quests will be answered in this hour. Don't assume that every single argument you had or you're prepared to have will be also addressed in this hour. But my prayer is that God will speak to your heart and that whatever you're seeking and searching, one way or another, will be addressed. If you approach it with this mindset, trust me, our God is a God that seeks. And that's one of the things that he did for all of us. He's a God that redeems, and he wants you to know more and more about him. Now that I said that, let me start with some of the most common arguments that I raised, that some of you probably are still raising and others will be raising, is the fact, you know, how can we know that the Bible isn't just an ancient book? I mean, it's a very good argument. Many believe that the Bible is written by just normal human being like me and you. And because of that reason, I used to think that the Bible cannot be the Word of God. How can it be the Word of God if Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah and Paul wrote these letters and John wrote the Gospel of John? I mean, these books bear their names to begin with. But the question is, did they write according to their own feelings and understandings or were they inspired to write what we have in our hand today? Makes the, that's a, makes a big difference when you think about it this way. Because any book, by the way, any religious book, and according to my research, there's about 26 of them that are here in the world today, but pick any one of them. Who wrote this book at the end of the day? It was written by a human being, and all of these books outside of the Bible, to my knowledge and according to my own research, have been delivered most of the time by one person. And that's one of the uniqueness that we're going to start seeing when it comes to the Bible. And of course, another argument you'll hear that having the Bible been tampered with, lost, some books are not there. You hear things like, what about the Gospel of Barnabas? What about the Gospel of Thomas? What about this Gospel? What about that Gospel? 
how come you only have these books and you left these books out? And so on and so forth. Yet again, we want to be discerning and we want to be honest with ourselves. When you do your search and seek and ask the truth and the true question and looking for answers, you need to put all of the elements and factors into consideration. Why is it that I only have 66 books? Why not 67 books? Why not 65 books? All of these are good questions. But when you begin to examine the process, you'll know that there is also reasons behind why those are the books that God, in his wisdom, decided that they are the books that are good for us. Enough for us to live by and to die by. For the last 3,500 years, this is the book that God chose to survive as his revelation, special revelation to mankind. Now, there are many ways to really examine if the Bible is worthy to be, trust, uh, to be trusted or not. I'm going to look at, it's actually three different ways. The two most common ones you hear all the time, external evidence and internal evidence. And I intentionally wanted to start with the external evidence. Let's start from the outside, walking our way into the Bible itself. Because if I start by telling you the Bible says that it's an inspired work of God, a word of God, because the Bible says in 2 Peter 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, that holy men of God were inspired by the Holy Spirit, driven by the Holy Spirit to write at us. You may look at me and say, well, that's a circular argument. You're using the Bible to prove itself. I hate to really burst your bubble at the end of the day, the Bible is the only authority I'm going to have to go back to and build my faith upon. Because if I'm going to argue and have objections, I can do this from now until the day I die. There is all sort of things you can argue, but at the end of the day, your faith will have to be built upon something. And in this case, it has to be built upon the truth. And in this case, the truth will come from somewhere and is revealed to us through a mean that is given to us. And then we're going to look at some internal evidence as well. For instance, one of the most powerful external evidence that I find to be compelling about the Bible, archaeological evidence. If we look at certain things and th certain discoveries that are being made and continues to be made, by the way, according to one of the most top archaeologists in the 20th century, there is more than 25 uh, 25,000 archaeological discoveries that have been made up until 1965. Notice we are not in 1965 anymore. That all of these 25,000 collaborate with what the Bible was saying about certain things. Now, God is a wise God, and he doesn't reveal things and these discoveries immediately. For one purpose or another, he allows some of the discoveries to be revealed at a certain time because he's meeting our needs. He wants us to be challenged by those kind of discoveries. One of those discoveries, for instance, that was made just in 1961, doubts, of course, arise all the time about whether Jesus is the real person or not, whether the story in the gospel talking about him and his trial is a real one. Was he really crucified? Was he put through such a trial as it's mentioned in all the Gospels? Well, one of those individuals that were responsible for making that decision to crucify him is Pontius Pilate, who was basically the governor, if you wish, of Judea, appointed by the Roman Empire. And it wasn't until 1961 when a discovery was made by accident. Some archaeologists were digging, basically, and they discover this uh, uh, tablet that has the name of Pontius Pilate written, basically, in the Latin language, identifying him to be the governor of Judea. And the age of that tablet also collaborates and corresponds with the, the time that the Bible was talking about. Why is this significant? Well, this now is one piece of that puzzle that was going through someone's mind. Is the gospel telling me the truth? And here is one piece in that gospel that you're reading about the crucifixion of Christ and the trial he went through. And here is one key figure that was responsible for that. We have an archaeological discovery that supports 
the existence of this person, for instance. And here is a picture of that inscription right here. Another uh, piece of archaeology. There is a high priest that existed also at the time of Christ who was also part of the legal trial that Jesus was put through. His name is Caiaphas. And many people doubted that such a name or such a person ever existed, or at times they would challenge that this Caiaphas was not the same Caiaphas that the gospel is talking about until a discovery was made in 1990 by accident, might I add, that archaeologists, in this case construction workers actually, were doing some remodel work south of Jerusalem, and the bulldozer happened to hit something on the ground and opened a hole and they discovered that there was a burial site. And in there, they found this uh, uh, basically um, uh, almost like a box that has the dry bone of a person. And on the side of that box, it says the name of this high priest Caiaphas, Joseph, son of Caiaphas, and the age, at least when it was tested, tells us that this is a person who was in his 60s and also, the archaeological dating collaborates also with the timing that the Bible has given us, and in this case, of course, the Gospels. So, this is another example that discoveries such as this are so helpful for us to show that events being reported to us in the Bible are not coming out of void. I'm focusing a lot on the Gospel because that's really the central theme in the Bible, whether Old Testament or New Testament, at the end of the day, it all points out to the work of Christ and what he has done. And here is an image of that. And by the way, you can always go yourself, of course, and investigate what I'm saying. It is a website that have this, weclaimingthemind.org. And you will find many other discoveries like this that are uh, pointed out, I mean, uh, listed in there. Here is another thing. In the Old Testament... King David, of course, and uh, I came from an Islamic background. I never doubted that David existed. But there are people, by the way, who really doubt David ever existed for one reason or another. Not to mention, if David didn't exist, then when the Bible talks about kings in 1st King and 2nd King coming from the house of David, that will become a complete joke. If David is not there, how can you say he even have a house and people who descended from him? until this discovery was made in 1993. A discovery showed that one of the Assyrian kings, bragging about the fact that he defeated one of the kings of Israel, wrote this record of his victory on this stone tablets that you're going to see right now. And in this piece, he recorded what he did, and he mentioned that he did defeat the king of Israel, who happens to be from the house of David. Up until then, many people have enough reasons to doubt the existence of David, not to mention his dynasty and his descendants, but by then, it really forced those scholars, at least, to go back to the drawing table and realize that the records given to us about the house of David are real. Now, why is the house of David becoming important? Well, because the promise of the Messiah to come from the house of David, and he will be the king that will sit on that throne, and his kingdom and dominion will be forever. If you take David out, you took that promise out completely, and now you make the Bible promise to look like it's a complete false, basically, promise and a joke, as I mentioned. Again, you are more than welcome to go and investigate this at BibleAndPictures.com. But even if you don't have the name, all you have to do is use a very powerful tool called Google, and you'll find anything you want these days. Another external evidence that, by the way, supports what the Bible is teaching. There are some that I didn't list in here. I'm going to mention them real quickly. There are some heresies and heretical writings that arose from within the church, by the way. After the church began to get established in the first century, there were some people that began to make false claims, and some who decided to come up with their own Bible, disagreeing 
with the Bible that was being circulated for whatever reason. And one of those, his name is Tatian, by the way. And Tatian took all of the four Gospels that we have and took about 70% of them and harmonized them. What I mean by that is he took the full story of Christ and took it in parts from this Gospel, that Gospel, and made the full story basically in one book. He called it his own Gospel. And he saved basically his work and considered that to be the Bible that he was going to follow. That work was discovered. Manuscripts of that work are there. And what we see from his own book, his own harmonized gospel, is that he borrowed from the existing gospels that we have verbatim. Whatever gospels we have in our hand today, he wrote from those gospels word for word. That is powerful when you have a piece of evidence like this. He could have basically wrote in his own way, but no. Even though he harmonized all four Gospels and made them work together in unity, he still took quotations verbatim from these Gospels that we have in our hand today. That's a very important discovery, of course. Here is another thing. We have dozens of writings, a lot of writings, outside of the Bible itself. That's why they're called extra-biblical writings. And those records, for instance, we find sometimes in the Assyrian records, in the Babylonian records, and the list can go on and on and on, that either make mention of events that the Bible reported, as the one we saw right now about the house of David, for instance. Sometimes even in Egypt, some of the pharaohs made references to certain things that collaborate with biblical stories. For instance, Psalm 104, by the way, exists in some of the Egyptian archaeologies. The entire psalm, almost the whole psalm, is there, which tells us, by the way, that there has been an influence by the existence of Israelites and Moses in there, because that would have been possibly one of the psalms that Moses wrote, even though it doesn't bear the name of anybody, but the fact that it's there tells us something about the story that is being reported to us in the Bible. Here is another thing. The book of Deuteronomy. Many scholars have tried to study the structure of the book of Deuteronomy. And it's written, by the way, as a legal, uh, basically, contract, if you wish. When you have a contract with someone, you would write the contract in a certain way. You have, uh, you know, first article, second article, third article, so on and so forth. And then you bring witnesses, and then finally, you would try to bring this deal, this agreement, into closing. It was discovered that the book of Deuteronomy was written in a style somewhat similar to the style that is found only in a kingdom called the Hittite kingdom. The Hittite kingdom has contracts written in a format similar to that, and it only existed between 1400 and 1200 BC, which tells us that that's exactly the time that the Exodus would have taken place and Moses and the Israelite would have been living around that time. That's the most important thing about that discovery. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, and I know what people think sometimes, doesn't mean that God took a Hittite agreement and just copied it. No, what it means, God is speaking to his people in a way that they would understand. I would expect God to speak to me in a way that I should relate to instead of bringing something new to me. If God back then was talking to the Israelite people about the iPhone, they will not understand what the iPhone is. But he used the iTablet, right? Because he wrote on a tablet. They would understand what's going on. But if God will speak in a way that they do not understand, it makes it difficult for them. You see, God has to come to our level and reach out to the way we think and we can comprehend. Sin doesn't allow us, by the way, to be perfect anymore. Doesn't give us that perfect mind to try to think the way God thinks. God says His ways and His thoughts are above ours, but He's willing to reach out to us. And that's one of the ways God is reaching out to us in His written Bible, basically. There is about, um, you know, external sources that mention, at least in this 
a quote I've given you here, 50 persons that are mentioned basically in the Old Testament and about 30 that are written about in the New Testament. If you want to know more about these figures that those extra writings we're talking about, like for instance, maybe talking about some of the kings, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, talking about some of the prophets that were encountered in those Old Testament times, you can find mentions of those things in Norm Geisler's book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And he will make mention of all of these. I even gave you the page number where you can find those. Here is also additional sources that has about 39 more sources outside of the Bible that were written within 150 years, by the way, of the life of Christ that attest that Jesus is real, talk about his disciples, talk about what happened to him, talk about his teachings, and so on and so forth. You can find some of those records if you want, or at least some of these discussions in this source, the historical Jesus, ancient evidence for the life of Christ by Gary Habermas. Um, here is some additional sources, by the way, that uh, made mentions of Jesus and the disciples and the church. Uh, Tacitus, who lived between 55 AD and 120 AD, which is pretty close to the events of the uh, crucifixion and also during the life of the apostles at some point. He was a Roman historian. He wrote about certain things that the Bible reported to us. And another person also lived around this time. The Jewish Talmud, by the way, that was written between at least the, there is a couple of Talmuds, this particular Talmud that was written between the 2nd and the 9th uh, century AD have a lot of records that talk also about Christ. Of course, uh, in this case, it wasn't talking about Christ to be the Messiah that the Jewish people were waiting for. It was talking about him as if he was a criminal that pretended to be that Messiah that they were waiting for. But nevertheless, historically, it does prove that Jesus did exist. Another powerful evidence, of course, are the manuscript evidence. We have about 25,000 different manuscript evidence, which is either complete records of biblical books and letters or fragments of those. And when studied in their original language, whether it's in Greek or in translations of the Greek, sometimes in other languages, Aramaic, Syriac, Egyptian, Ethiopic, Arabic, you look at all of those and they compare those writings to what we have in our hand today as the Bible that we know, there is a lot of these evidence in there that support that the Bible we had in our hand is the same Bible that these fragments are telling us. Those fragments, at least until 1947, used to go all the way until about 800 years after the time of Christ, until a major discovery was made. And that's in 1947, which is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Basically, a number of scriptures that were hidden inside of caves called the Qumran Caves, and they were hidden in jars. And by mistake, those were discovered when a small shepherd, uh, he is a, an Arab shepherd about 12 years of age, uh, he lost one of his sheep and he was throwing rocks and he heard something break in one of these caves and he walked in and he discovered those jars. Initially, he didn't know what he has his hand on until archeologists basically discovered that those are records of biblical writings that date all the way to almost 200 BC, meaning 200 years before the time of Christ. And here's what we have in those records. We have basically copies of every book of the Old Testament with the exception to the book of Esther. In some cases, there were multiple copies of the same book. The book of Isaiah is an example of that. Okay? We have, for instance, 19 copies of the book of Isaiah, 25 copies of Deuteronomy, 30 copies of the Psalms, which means that we have multiple records to show us that everything that they had at that time was based on a source because they're identical in their writings. It wasn't like one book of Psalms was different than the other, or one book of Deuteronomy was different than the other, or one book of Isaiah was different than the other. Not at all. In fact, the book of Isaiah that we have, there is one called the, uh, also the great scroll of Isaiah. Nevertheless, 
they discover that they are identical to the book of Isaiah that we have with the exception to seven different words. And the variations has to do just with grammatical ways of saying things or different ways of saying different words. And I would expect that to happen. For instance, some of you might have heard of the King James Bible back in the 17th century. That was Old English. If you read it today, you may feel some difficulties. Why? Because we don't speak Old English. Therefore, we have other translations, NIV, for instance, or ESV. What they did is they relied on the same original manuscript, but now we're writing it in English that you and I today, in our modern day, can understand. But that doesn't mean that the King James is no good. The King James is written for a group of people at a certain time in a language that they could understand. But it's all translations based on the original manuscripts. It's not different Bibles. And that's how I used to think, at least. The Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, have allowed the biblical scholars and the textual critics, which, by the way, that's one of the things that I want to mention to you about the evidence why we can trust the Bible. To my knowledge, and based on my own research that I've done, and I go to seminary and I've studied these things for the last five years, but the Bible is probably the only book that has been scrutinized over and over and over again throughout the history of mankind, and yet it survives all of these scrutinies. The Bible is open for textual criticism. God is not going to be bent out of shape if you try to challenge his writing, because at the end of the day, he's going to win. He welcomes you to go and challenge. But the problem is when we're told, like I used to in my case, not to ever dare to question what I believe in. I don't think God wants me to be a computer, a robot, not to think, not to feel, not to challenge, not to seek. In the Bible, God wants you to do this. Jesus told the Pharisees, the religious leaders, search the books. He's talking to the religious leaders. Imagine you and I who are not religious leaders. Because it's important at the end of the day that you search the books and see for yourself if what you're hearing is true. The writing of the church fathers. Now you have the first church, of course, the first century church, all the way to the third century BC, uh, I mean uh, AD. You have the apostles and then you have the church fathers that came after them. It is important, of course, to begin to look at the writing the quotations that they were quoting from, their sermons, and so on and so forth. We discover that they made 86,000 quotations and references to the Bible from different books. Here is the beauty about our modern day. You can just go to Amazon or Google and find all of their writings online for free. And you'll see the quotations, and you can even examine these quotations against the Bible that you have in your hand and see if they're quoting it correctly or not. Here's another uh, astounding information about this. If you take all of the quotations that the church fathers basically had, and you put these quotations together, you can reassemble the entire New Testament with the exception to 17 verses. So you don't even need manuscript evidence. Just by taking their quotations and putting it together. I suggest to you the reason why we have such a strong evidence is one quotation from the Old Testament and another from the New Testament. Here's what the Bible says in the New and Old Testament. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. You see, God will be lying if he doesn't fulfill this. And God will be weak if he could not ensure that this will take place. Jesus himself says, heaven and earth will pass away, they will be destroyed, but my words will by no means pass away. 2,000 years later, I am quoting to you what Jesus says. And 2,700 years later, I'm quoting to you what Isaiah was inspired to say. 
this is a testimony by itself that what is being said here is the truth. And it will stand for the next 2,000 years. How do I know this? Because God's word said so. And God has proved it in many ways that he will protect his word. Why is that important that for God should protect his word? If God wants me to know him, and if God wants me to know what he has done for me, and if God wants me to be saved and spend eternity with him, then I sure hope that God is going to protect his word that he's expecting me to build my faith upon and to come to a saving knowledge based on. This is why those kind of promises are important. Now that I finish with the external evidence, let's take a look at some internal evidence. Okay, well, I'm going to focus on the gospel again, and the only thing that I wanted to focus on is the prophecies related to the gospel. For instance, we have a lot of Old Testament prophecies. In fact, in some estimates, it's closer to 300 prophecies that talk about the Messiah and his coming and how he's going to live, what he's going to do, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his glorification. They are all fulfilled to the letter based on what we have as prophecies in the Old Testament and what the New Testament also shares with us. For instance, it tells us that he will be born of the seed of Abraham. This is where we find it in Old Testament. You go, for instance, to Matthew chapter 1, and it does talk that Jesus came from the seed of Abraham. It talks that he will be from the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49.10. In Revelations, it tells us that he is uh, basically the king of Judah, the lion of Judah. From the lineage of David, 2 Samuel 7.12. In Matthew alone, it talks about him being from the house of David, from the King David. In Micah 5.2, it tells us that he will come from Bethlehem. You go to the account of his birth in Matthew chapter 1, and it says that Joseph and Mary went going, ended up going to Bethlehem for his birth, and so on and so forth. The virgin birth of Christ. You will find this prophecy fulfilled, of course, in all the Gospels, but in particular, Matthew makes reference to these things and so on and so forth. You get the idea. I mean, everything that is being mentioned to the point that even when he says in, on, the cro on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I get asked this question all the time. Well, if Jesus is God, why is he saying this? I hear it all the time. I get it. The point what Jesus was trying to make here is this. He's not denying his deity. He came for a purpose to die on the cross, to fulfill promises, and to fulfill prophecies. And when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was pointing out that he is a fulfillment of the prophecy found in Psalm 22. Because guess what Psalm 22, 1 says? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even on the cross, Jesus was still doing his ministry, pointing out that he is a fulfillment of those prophecies that speak about him. Here is some important also evidence that the Bible is a unique book. Whether you agree or disagree, I'm not trying here in any way to tell you that I expect you at the end of my lecture to come forward and accept Christ, although that would be very cool, by the way, if you can do that. But nevertheless, I'm expecting you to take this evidence that I'm sharing and whatever else you've been sharing, uh, we've been researching, I'm sorry, and try to examine for yourself. Does the evidence make sense? Are these evidence compelling for you to search deeper and deeper? For instance, the unity found in the Bible is unbelievable, by the way. What I mean by that is you have a book called the Bible that has Old Testament section, New Testament section, 39 books in Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, 66 books, they all teach you the same thing. They were written by different people over a span of almost 3,500 years, or at least in the days of the New Testament, would have been about 1,500 years by that time. And yet, they are all consistent in their teaching. Luke doesn't agree with Paul. Paul doesn't agree with, uh, disagree with Isaiah. Isaiah doesn't disagree with Moses. 
and David does not disagree with what John is teaching, you get the idea. They all teach the same thing. They all point to the same thing. They all tell us one important thing about the God that has revealed that Bible. He is a God of redemption, a God who is redeeming his people back to himself, a God who wants them to be with him, to have fellowship with him, to spend eternity with him. All 66 books written by people didn't even meet, didn't know each other, still inspired by the same God to share the same story. Imagine this, by the way. I want you to think about it from an academic standpoint. If you were to write a research paper and cite 66 references for me as your professor, and all of these 66 references collaborate what you're telling me, think about this. How powerful do you think your research is going to be compared to someone else who wrote the same research and gave me only one quotation from one book? Just think about that and ask yourself, which one will have more compelling evidence and convincing argument to try to reason with? I mentioned this to you already, and it's important to know that all of 66 books have harmony. They all collaborate with one another. They never disagree with each other. I'm going to keep moving here. Show you a couple of examples. For instance, many of the Bible authors, by the way, have different educational backgrounds. Not all of them, by the way, have the same degree or graduated from the same college. Some of them will fishermen, farmers, Pharisees, accountant, basically, if you wish. Others were religious people like Paul, doctors like Luke, and the list can go on and on and on. Even in Old Testament, Moses' background is completely different than Joshua's background. Joshua's background is completely different than David, who was a king. Solomon was different. But yet all of them wrote, inspired by the same God, about things that teaches the same thing to us today. I cannot go to the Psalms and discover that I'm not saved by grace because there's a problem, because the Bible teaches me that I am saved by the grace of God. If I find that one of these books disagrees with this particular faith doctrine, then there is a contradiction here. If the Bible teaches that the Messiah is going to come to die on the cross for our sins, and Isaiah wasn't teaching something like this, or the Old Testament wasn't alluding to something like this, and the New Testament all of a sudden teaches me something different, there is a problem. But Paul, when he accepted Christ, who was a Pharisee, by the way, who studied the Old Testament, who was a teacher of the Old Testament, was quoting from the Old Testament to convince his audience that Jesus of the New Testament is no other than the fulfillment of these prophecies. Why? Because he trusted that those scriptures are unified in their message. And here is another powerful thing. There is about 40 to 60 generations passed, basically, when the Bible was being written and passing through to us by more than 40 writers. And think about this. Writers that wrote from Babylon or from Judea or from Antioch, modern-day Turkey, or sometimes minor, Asia Minor, or even from other parts of the world, they all wrote to us inspired by the same God. This is a testimony that they're receiving their inspiration from the same source. At least hear me out. I'm just sharing with you my own line of reasoning here. Many of the authors were separated, by the way, by hundreds of miles from each other geographically also in their locations. Why do you think that's important? Because especially if you think about it in their days, these days you're going to say, well, someone lives in Turkey, big deal. I mean, probably in six hours I can make it to Turkey. In those days, I don't think so. It will probably take you months and months to make it to Turkey from here. The fact that they lived in different geographical areas tells us that they're receiving inspirations from the same God without even sometimes having knowledge of other existing writings. They didn't even know that there are writings that collaborate with what they themselves were sharing about. That's why this is significant. 
and the fact that they didn't know each other, of course, if they lived at the same time, like the Gospels, for instance, not all the four eyewitness accounts, uh, people basically lived together at the same time, but God still allowed each one of them to report to us the Gospel from a different angle. We talked about this. Um, another important thing, the Bible, in its original language, Old Testament is written in Hebrew and a portion in Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. Now, there is a, an important reason why we have the original language of the New Testament in Greek. In fact, up until almost 150 BC, some will say about 200 BC, the Hebrew Bible was still written in Hebrew and in Aramaic, but God, by His wisdom, allowed the Hebrew Bible to be translated also in the Greek in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. So that when the New Testament is written in Greek, even the people of the Old Testament would understand what the New Testament is trying to teach them. We call that translation the Septuagint. That's the translation of the Hebrew Bible and the Aramaic portion of that Hebrew Bible into Greek. But here is another interesting thing. I speak from my own experience. I am privileged to tell you that I read the, Arabic in, in Arabic, uh, the Bible in Arabic. I read the Bible in English. But in the last two years, and some of you probably have the same privilege, I studied the Hebrew language of the Bible, and I studied the Greek language of the Bible. And every time I study the Bible in any of these languages, it still has the same profound impact on my life, deeper spiritual impact. It's not like when I read it in Greek, I feel like, Oh, man, I'm, I don't know why the English was telling me this when the Greek actually is saying that. I did not know that Jesus didn't die on the cross. How come the English is saying that? Not at all. Actually, sometimes I feel the English translation is not doing the Greek even a fair assessment because there are deeper meanings that could be found in the Greek word that if you write maybe a whole paragraph about that word, still not going to give it its justice. What I'm trying to say is this. The Bible in different languages, still the Word of God, deals with our heart issues and give us that hope. No matter what language you read the Bible in. And these days, God bless the Ab store. You can go and download the Bible in any language you want. Any language you want. And guess what? You will still have the same impact that the English Bible will give you, that the original Greek will give you, that the Hebrew will give you. Okay. Bible and science. Let me say this. I am aware of scientific arguments all the time that are used to support other books. And I'm also aware that the scientific evidence could also go the other way. And someone will say, well, actually, science disagrees with what you're saying. Let me say it up front here. If you tell me that the Bible is saying sunrise and sun goes down, this is wrong scientifically, and I don't believe in the God of the Bible because he made such a huge mistake, how does he think this way? Doesn't he know that the sun doesn't rise and doesn't go down? It's actually the earth that goes around? If the Bible is asserting with certainty that this is what's taking place, astronomically speaking, scientifically speaking, then I would agree with you. And I would say, absolutely, my God just made a scientific mistake. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible is not a science book, by the way. And if you think science is going to prove if the Bible is correct, you're really taking the wrong road. Because that's not what the Bible is for. However, let me assure you that God in the Bible speaks to me and you in a way that we would understand. Let me ask you, for instance, just us who know this fact that the earth goes around and it's not the sun that rises or goes down. How many times you tell people that I'm going to meet you at sunrise or sundown? You're wrong yourself. Why do you use something wrong? Because that's not scientifically accurate. But why do you use this language? Because that's the only way we can communicate with each other. 
we see the sun going up and going down. God sometimes shares things like this with us in the Bible because that's how we can understand. And he's saying, fine, you call it sunrise, I get you. I'm going to use sunrise in this verse. Now you get it? Okay, we'll talk. Don't get upset. It's just reasoning with you. But let's look at some things that it's impossible that for God didn't know. Innumerable stars. If you want to count the stars, by the way, you are not going to be able to count them. In fact, some people in the past used to count and they say there's about 1,600 stars. Some will say, no, 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 there's about 1,300. Others will say 1,400. Why? That's what they see. You know what we're being told today? There is a number that I came across yesterday. I couldn't even pronounce the number. Apparently, a number that you add 27 different zeros to, and that's how much they think there are stars. And yet, God says he calls each star by name. That is an amazing thing, by the way, when you think about it. Because that's what the Bible says. He knows each star by its name. And we're still discovering, by the way, the universe. The Hubble telescope, still going and going and going, better than the Energidal Bunny, that's for sure. And we'll keep going, and we'll keep seeing pictures. What does that tell you about the universe? We haven't even fathomed the width of this universe. So the Bible tells us this in Jeremiah 33, 22. You can't even count the stars. Job says that the earth is circled. Job also says that the earth is suspended. Those are powerful, by the way. In fact, even Isaiah tells us that the earth is in a sphere, the shape of a sphere. To me, I can look at those things and say, well, gee, how did these people know this? They didn't have the technology that you and I have. Now, you can go and say, well, other books have other scientific discoveries, well, that's, that, that's a different argument. We can always deal with that. But nevertheless, if we want to look at the Bible from a scientific standpoint, we have some evidence of things in there as well. Why does Jeremiah say this? Or Job basically speak this way? Or Isaiah say something like that? Because holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The God who inspired Peter to write this is the God who inspired Jeremiah to say this and inspired Job to speak this way, and inspired Isaiah to say what he did. That's why we have those kind of evidence. Another important factor, for me at least, when it came to my search about the Bible and whether the Bible is truth or not, is that the authors sometimes speak about own, their own faults. Peter mentions in the Gospel of Mark, which, by the way, also traditionally known as the Gospel of Peter because he's the one who was dictating it to Mark, and Mark was one of his students, and he was writing it for him, called himself Satan in there. Jesus told him, get it behind me, Satan. Peter. I mean, if you know Peter, you would think Peter will never do something like this. But yet Peter was honest enough to share what he was inspired to write. I mean, if it would, have, it would have been me, I would have wiped out that section about myself, definitely. I will not tell people that I'm Satan, or I'm wicked, like Paul says. Or the Bible reports to us that David, King David, committed adultery and paid a price for that. Or that Abraham lied not once, but twice. And his son Isaac lied also. Gee, that's fun. Why do I need to know this? Because the Bible is telling me something about my human nature. I am a sinful person, whether I am King David or someone like me. In the eye of God, you are still the same sinful human being that needs God's righteousness to survive. That's the only way it's going to work. David is not saved by his own works. He is saved by God's mercy and grace. And so... Did I? That's the only way I will be saved. Noah, you know, many, there are many things in the Bible that tells me that the Bible doesn't hold anything back. I mean, what's the harm, by the way, in sharing these things? 
Imagine if the Bible doesn't share any of these things with us and make us think that these people were perfect. Big difference if you tell me that David was perfect versus when you tell me, guess what? David did something even more horrible than the sin that you just mentioned to me. And look what the Bible is saying about it. Think about the comfort you get immediately that God is revealing to you about the life of these heroes and their shortcomings sometimes. They're human being at the end of the day. Versus if David was perfect, his life was immaculate, there was no problems in there. I can't relate to David then, if that's the case. I cannot really think like David. I cannot compare myself like him. Then I have a problem. I'm going to say, well, David is different than me. That's David. No, no, no. David is not different than you. David is like you and me. He also was sinful and he needed a savior. And then I want to close with this. The writers of the Bible, and most of them were apostles in the New Testament at least, and some even in the Old Testament, some of the prophets, paid a hefty price for the message that they were sharing. If, and only if, the apostles were lying, then I think they were the most stupid people I have ever heard about. Why would you die for a lie? crucified, beheaded, one of them was filleted alive, one was sawn in half, like Isaiah. Why would you do something like this? By the way, in those days, these guys did not sign a book deal on Amazon and made millions. So you can't tell me that there is financial motivation for that. They could have hidden and ran away in those days at least they don't have technology that we have today to track you down by your phone. All right? What I'm saying is these people didn't have any benefit to gain from this supposed lie if they were lying. They paid a price and a hefty one for preaching the gospel. Matthew was slain with an axe. Mark was stoned and then beheaded. No, another one, I'm sorry. Luke was hung. John, tortured and was exiled. James, the brother of John, his brother, was beheaded. Just go to the book of Acts and read about that. Philip was hung up also. And the list can go on and on and on. And here's my question. Why? For what price? What was the benefit behind their lies if they were lying? And let's assume this guy was lying. Don't you think after what happened to him that this guy will say, my bad, I'm not going to even preach anymore. Or Andrew, going to run away. Or Jude, I, I don't want you to talk to me about the Bible, period. Or Paul, dude, don't talk to me about the Bible. and I don't even know Jesus anymore. That's not what happened. They kept on preaching. Paul was imprisoned twice before he was captured the third time. In other words, he didn't learn the first time, didn't learn the second time, and he still kept on going. Peter, knowing what happened also with Paul, still kept on preaching until he himself died. Why? If they didn't believe in the truth that they were sharing in the Bible, the Word of God, the work of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, we have to ask ourselves these questions. If we're intellectual, those are questions that demand an answer, by the way. For us, for ourselves. We have to reason with ourselves. You know why? Because there'll come a day when each one of us will give an account for this very lecture that we are attending, for these reasons that we are listening to, for not researching it beyond where we're at, to see for ourselves if the Bible is worthy or not. With that, I want to open it up for questions and answers, and maybe we'll go for about uh, five to ten minutes. Yes, sir? Have other books claimed they were, um, that they can't be changed, and, um, and have they been changed? Other books, you mean like other religious books? Uh, yeah. Uh, you're not talking about the Bible here, you're talking about other books outside. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, to my knowledge, basically, I speak only about the Quran. The Quran does make that claim that no one can change the word of God. 
and it did include the Bible, as a matter of fact, as one of those words and books that cannot be changed. So, yes, there is that claim. However, that's not the only reason why I am going to look at the Bible as worthy more than the Quran. I have to examine both. In my case, of course, I had the Quran, and I was comparing the Bible, and I began to do my studies, and I was told that the Bible is corrupt, therefore I have to see for myself why is it corrupt and where is it corrupt, who corrupted it, when was it corrupt, why was it corrupted, and how come we cannot find any copies of other Bibles than the ones that we have in our hand today to prove that there has been some manipulation and changes, for instance. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay, well, uh, the question is, uh, if I hear you um, uh, correctly, you're saying that the miracles apparently is the evidence that I can use to say that Jesus is God, right? But actually not. Those are not the only thing that will allow me to say that Jesus is God. The Bible says that Jesus changed water into wine. Well, I'm, I'm back again to myself. I believe the Bible, therefore I believe that that's exactly what happened. For instance, let's go to the time of Moses. The Bible says that Moses raised the staff and the Red Sea was split into two parts and people walked. Well, I'll either have to believe that the story is real or I have to say this is just a myth and someone wrote it. But did that make Moses God? Of course not. That's not the intent behind it, because it's clear that Moses received an order from God. But Jesus, whenever he did something, whether miracles like this, or even raising someone from the dead, or healing people, he never ever in the Gospels recorded to say, I'm going to ask God to have this happen. He does it by his own power, by his word. But there is other reasons why we believe Jesus is God, because the Old Testament speaks about him, the divine servant who will come in in the flesh, who is going to save us from our sins, who is going to die, and who is going to do all of these things. So there is more than just these miracles. So I wish I can tell you how I can prove a miracle like this to you, other than just trusting that the Bible says it happens, and it will happen, according to what the Bible says. How can it happen? I don't know. Now, I can prove certain things, by the way, science tried to prove certain things from the time of Moses. The ten plagues, plagues, by the way, that Moses basically, at least the nine plagues, basically, that he did against the Egyptian, uh, you know, ancient Egyptian people. You can use the nature, basically, to prove that. The fact that the Nile turned red, it's possible that the mud in there somehow surfaced in there. Or the rain that was, uh, I mean, the, uh, the increased level of uh, insects in there. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, you know, basically natural things that can happen that allow for these insects to increase like that, or even the frogs, or many other things. There are natural ways sometimes to explain it. So, if you want to look at it that way. But uh, I emphasize to you that this is not the only reason, by the way, that Jesus is God. There are many other things as well. Yes, sir. The Bible has been written by different authors uh, over 2,000 years and uh, by 66 people as I understood. Uh, f 40, 40 people, 66 books, yeah. How to make certain uh, that it is completed by now and uh, all of these authors were inspired by the God? And if later on one person claims that he has the God's word and claims some good word and he's a good person, mm -hmm. can we include it in the Bible as the Bible very good question. How do we know that their work is complete? I speak to you again as a person who believes in the Bible, and I'm sure others who believe in it will say the same thing. I have to trust that God have allowed me to have the portion that he felt is important and necessary for me from Isaiah or from Peter or from John that I needed to know. If there is a portion that is missing, Really, it's the burden of proof is not on me, it's on God. Why did God allow that portion to be missing? 
So I have to trust that. Second of all, how do we know that they were all inspired? It's a very good question. We have to look now and examine the teaching of each book. Do they contradict each other? Let's look at the big picture. Are they contradicting each other? Let's look at specific teachings. Do they contradict each other? If there is contradiction, then we know there is a problem. Then, let's say someone comes in today and he's an excellent spiritual man, very good man. I mean, he does the right things, says the right things. Can I accept his writing as inspired? No, because the Bible says it is finished. And what cannot add or delete from the Bible 2,000 years ago. Therefore, by the account of the Bible, I'm not allowed anymore to accept anyone who comes later. Jesus says, there'll be others that will come in, but he says also and warn us that those will be false people. And I have to watch out from this. Now, does that mean if there is a, a wise person and a spiritual person and maybe someone who's a believer who speaks wisely, God inspired these people, by the way, sometimes to give us wise advice, I'm not going to turn my ear away from this person, but that doesn't mean whatever the person is saying should be scriptural now and should be added to the Bible and I have to implement it in everybody else's life. If someone comes to me, let's say this person says, I really think your calling is to teach at a college. I may feel like, you know what, this is a confirmation to what I've been thinking about for a while, I've been praying about. But that doesn't mean I have to take his writing now and put it in the Bible and say, guess what? Each one of you, when you come into the children of Abraham and speak, you have to become a teacher of the Bible now. It doesn't work that way. Um, am I here? Okay. Um, looks like we are done. Thank you so much.